So I'm here today with, is it Panurge? How do you say this? Panurge? Yeah, that's, that's pretty close. Yeah, sure. Okay. And this is a French word. What does that mean? So it comes from Greek originally. Uh, basically, it just means knave or rogue. But ah. um, yeah, and it's a character in uh, one of my favorite books uh, uh, by Rabelais. The, it's a, um, the uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel, which I don't know if you've read that, but it's, uh, it's a great Renaissance uh, uh, satire. I'll uh, I'll have to check that out. Um, yeah. when I I I wasn't I wasn't really sure what it meant. It looked like Pan, like the Greek god Pan, but then I know Pan in in uh you know could also be all, so all encompassing urge. I I wasn't really sure what. Right. Uh, well, that's actually yeah. That's that's um. It comes it comes from that. Yeah. Um. I think the Greek word is Pan Orgos. Um. Mm. It's it, it you know the um, the uh what do you call um. The character in the book isn't, it's complicated because it's a Renaissance novel. So they, the word doesn't necessarily correspond to any, uh, um, you know, direct um, uh, character from, from that, from that milieu. It's a, uh, it's just the, the basic sense of the word, I guess. Right. Uh, so, so there's a lot of things that I want to ask you, but let me continue to introduce you and, um, and, the, and the reason why I wanted to speak to you today. Um, it centers around a, I suppose a work of fiction. Uh, <laughs> it would be interesting if it sure. wasn't fiction. Uh, it's it's a uh, Panurge is an author, and the reason why he's going by a pen name is also something that we will get into in a little while. Um, but but I want to I want to talk about um, a very interesting short story that that you wrote, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's it's called the Saints of. Cinesius or Kinesius, depending on whether or not you want to pronounce that hard C, uh, yes. the way that uh, it, people are starting to, uh, so, well, people are starting to pronounce Cicero, like Kikero, Kikero, and I think we're trying to get more accurate in our uh, Latin pronunciation. Is, that, is, yeah. <laughs> is, is Kinesius or Cinesius, is this a Latin or Greek uh, name? Uh, so that's, that's Greek. That goes back to, he's a, um, he's a sort of, um, uh, 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 little known. I think he had um, books that didn't survive. One of the many uh, ancient writers whose works didn't survive. There's just mentions of him in, um, uh, you know, scattered throughout uh, what does survive of the ancient uh, literature. Um, he was hated uh, by Aristophanes, supposedly. And uh, that's... Ah, I remember. I remember yeah. from... Okay. All right. So so the, the complete title of this short story is called The Sayings of Cinesius, a Manuscript. Correct? Correct. All right. And you can read this. I highly recommend you go uh, and read this on um, a publication called Terror House Magazine. Is that, yeah, is that also? That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. I will link that in the description so that you can go and click that. And, and uh, I highly recommend you read it. If, like me, you work a lot and you're exhausted all the time and at the end of the <laughs> long day, you can't bear the thought of, you're, you can't physically like process text. I actually, I took the whole thing and I copied and pasted it into a, um, a, a, a text to speech, uh, like AI gen it did a pretty good okay. job. I really enjoyed just listening to it as an audio book, but, uh, but anyway, I highly, highly recommend it. It's one of the most, I want to say gratifying or satisfying, like it's one of the most enjoyable things that I've read by a contemporary author in the last year or so, maybe a little bit longer. I, I and you know Thank what? You. Definitely one of the most interesting things I've read by somebody who I'm in contact with, which yeah. is like, you know, yeah, got me excited to talk to to talk well, I'm to. You I'm pleased to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me I, let me explain why I like it. For again, for I want to give the viewer, the listener, uh, a, a chance to uh, to to kind of to understand what's unique about this. At least what I I think is unique about it. I mean, first off, anyone who's familiar with um, with my artwork or my writing will know that I'm fascinated with uh, classical antiquity and. Um, and yet I, I don't like escapism. I, I find it like it's, mm. I mean, I, I don't want to say that I don't like it, but like, I want what I love in, in those things to have a relevancy to real world, real, our life, sure. here, the here and the now, you know what I mean? Sure. Absolutely. And I felt like your story really, it, it really did that. It achieved that. 
And um, I, I just want to give a brief overview of sort of what it's about, and uh, uh, for for again for the listener. So it's a, it's about um, a guy who I assume is a writer, um, who's who's living in Chicago, correct? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. And he he's just sort of um, I don't know how you would describe <laughs> him. He's sort of like a humbug kind of like. I don't know, like a, a, a cynical type, a cynical type, right? He's yeah, a little, yeah. He's a little down on life. He 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 finds pleasure where he can, and one of the things that he likes to do is uh, go out on cold days and watch people suffering in the streets of Chicago, <laughs> and then he'll take refuge in a li- in libraries as he finds them. In one day, he f- comes across as he's taking refuge from the cold in a library. He comes across a strange manuscript that has just been stuffed into a random bookshelf and uh it looks as if you know it's just someone just made this and stuffed it in there for for someone like him to find and it turns out to be a um it turns out to be a book that a book about well you know what why don't uh panerj why don't you take it from here because i don't want to mess it up how will you encapsulate this story for for someone who might want to read it Right. Well, so far, yeah, that's a great um, introduction to it. But uh, I guess what, what it is, is um, there's two things going on. First, the the, the manuscript itself, with it, which is a kind of strange satirical uh, work that essentially transposes um, a kind of a Diogenes type from the ancient world, sort of, a, 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 a you know, a, an ancient cynic, uh, humorously into the modern American uh, landscape, specifically the Midwestern landscape. And there's a lot of fixation on uh, the sort of strip mall uh, periphery of uh, our American towns. Uh, so that in itself is kind of the situation, that, which is already, I think, a humorous situation. Um, but then also the um, the narrator, as he's reading it, tries to come up with a kind of biography uh, of the, uh, you know, the mysterious person who wrote this manuscript, who who not only wrote it, but decided to print it out and kind of bind it himself. And as you say, kind of shove it into the uh, the stacks to see who finds it. And, you know, it, it raises the question, obviously, what sort of a fellow would do such a thing? Um, so the, the rest of the story is Wait, basically the, yeah. What sort of fellow would shove the, the book right. in or what sort of fellow makes up the story about the guy who shoves it? Because well, I feel like there both, you are... go. both. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, well, right. The reader the hopefully things... is asking that question, right? So the, yeah. the narrator is asking who wrote this. The reader is also asking, you know, who would read this? Who would think about this? What a strange, uh, you know. So, so there's there's these weird levels. It's 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 a very it's very interesting how multi layered it is because on one level you're reading you're it's a story about this guy who finds a manuscript. On another level, it's a story about the guy he imagines wrote the manuscript. And then on the last level is the actual manuscript itself. So you have all these levels all the way down. That's one of the things that I found really fascinating about it. And um, at some point, the, the, the story that the guy's spinning in his mind becomes more important than the manuscript itself. In fact, you, you, I think the majority of the text is actually the guy's imagination on who this author is, as right. opposed to what the author is actually writing. I think. Yeah, that's that's right. I'd say probably a little bit, maybe not, you know, the the great majority, but there's definitely a lot of it. Yeah. But um, and then, the, well, then there's also these 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 sort of asides where the narrator comes in. See, yeah, we could also introduce the narrator as another character because. The narrator's mm-hmm. explaining what the character's thinking about uh, the the manuscript, but not necessarily in moment. Like so, like this is when it just gets goes on to the sort of the more like macroscopic kind of philosophical analyses of the the significance of of it's okay. Basically, <laughs> it's a it, sure. it's a multi layered story with a lot of with a very interesting blend of like you know high culture sort of philosophical musings but at the same time like the gutter type of yes. uh you know it's it's a fusion in fact there's a there's a line i was looking for it because i wanted to copy and paste it to ask if you could read it maybe you know it maybe you know it enough to just read it um from from memory but there's a when he's suddenly uh he's suddenly channeling heraclitus i believe and and then mm. there's the bits of styrofoam. Can, do you know that line? Is it? Do you have it nearby? Could you 
Could you um, read that? If you I'd give me a sec, I could bring it up. Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Okay, I'm going to read it because I found it. All right. Okay. In fact, it was likely that even if I had gotten the biography right, down to the last detail, such a framing of these sayings would have missed the point entirely. And now it's, you can tell by the way that it's, the text is placed, this is the, the book that he's found, so. Oh, right. what was scattered gathers again, he began, channeling Heraclitus. As the styrofoam and the leaves blow in the wind and settle again onto the curbstone, as the plastic bags and the newspapers circle the dustbin and land again on its rim. So too, the dealers on the corner scatter when the sirens sound and, the and form as one body again in the alley behind the abandoned KFC. Yes, and you too will assemble and separate and in fits of peak, or is that peak? I don't know yeah. how to pronounce that. Yeah. It's a peak scream yourself hoarse until weak and then again until the weakness burns off and strength returns to the empty vessel. And again, you reassemble, having proven yourself in anger to the each to the other. I'm there you go. I'm so bad at reading. Did I read it right? No, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Okay. I have this, I'm getting like dyslexia in my old age where like I can barely trust what I'm like looking at as I read. So I'm going to have to read, but, but, but so, so, I mean, God, I, I found that a really beautiful line and um, I don't know, I feel like that line sort of encapsulates the whole, or those lines encaps, encapsulate the, the, the vibe of the whole thing. You, you know, you've got the references to uh, the pre-Socratic, uh, um, um, philosopher Heraclitus, mm -hmm. and you've got, you know, the abandoned KFC, the imagery of this sort of, and I, I, I love the, uh, as the styrofoam <laughs> blows through. Yeah. With the, something about that. Just yeah, like, it's, a, it's a mix of, of uh, you know, kind of outlandish, um, uh, you know, humor with, with something that's actually, there is, there is a level um, on which it's also kind of serious. It's, it's, uh, I hope, you know, it's a kind of a combination yeah. of those two things. Um, exactly. That's why that line hits me because it does, it does, it does do both of those things beautifully. It's, it's comical and, and yet there's this undercurrent of, of seriousness at the same time. Yeah. On and several levels, just, because on one level there's, you know, like the, the sort of the, the basic idea of the, the, the sadness of the, the decomposition of, of the form that it, but, but on another level, and I would say on a deeper level, it's this reference to this utter wasteland we inhabit in the modern world. Right. That, yep. That right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of, yeah. And I've written a lot of my stuff. Um, I, I do it another story in Terror House that's called uh, Brzezinski's Adult Book Emporium that it deals with a similar landscape, the kind of half abandoned, you know, post-industrial Midwest, uh, right. which is the setting of most of my work. Yeah. I, I read that one too, and, and that's also a good one. If anybody wants to check that out, if they're already in the Tarot House magazine site, they could also look up. Uh, this is like a Polish name, I think. I can't I can't pronounce it, but Br Brzezinski. Br uh, Brzezinski, yeah. Well, the I, I mean the Americanized version is yeah, Br Brzezinski, yeah. Okay, Adult Book Emporium, and yep. uh, yeah, that's a, that's a fun read. Um, oh, I I now I I could see your name here it's going to be covered up so they won't be able to see it but is it polish sure. you have polish in the background i have yeah i do have polish in my background i have uh, among other things but but uh, half polish yeah um so and there's a lot of uh, polish people in the in the midwest it's one of the main right. well in the, in the chicago metro area in particular which at one time and i, I think still has uh, as many, I think the only place where there's more Polish people in one city is is uh is warsaw but i think uh, chicago has most uh, the most uh, after that Interesting. I, I mean, I was thinking about it. It's, it's interesting because like, you know, I know there's also a lot of Scandinavian people and it's like such a cold place, you know, so it, it, I guess it, it like, you know, you go from one cold environment to another, they, yeah. they could thrive there. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's, it is, you know, the, the, the urban Midwest, particularly the, the part by Lake Michigan, you know, Chicago up through Milwaukee and, and so forth, there, there is a kind of a unique a uh, cluster of backgrounds up there that's a little bit different than most of the rest of the country you know it's uh, a lot of Polacks, a lot of uh a lot of well a lot of germans that's not so uncommon but then there's also a lot of scandinavians up here too so yeah, yeah. 
So, so at this point, we could go in many different directions, but I think I want to I want to um, linger for a moment on the idea of the Midwest, and um, and then we'll we'll come back to some of these other things. We'll come back to uh, you know the legacy of Greece and Rome, classical classical education, you know, uh, the state of it, uh, can right. the, the canon or the loss of the canon. There's a lot of things that I want to talk about in, in here. I want to talk about the state of, um, you know, publishing what it's like as an, an up and coming writer up against the sort of um, strange things going on in the publishing world today. I want to talk about, uh, I want to go back to uh, Brzezinski's Adult Book Emporium. I did have a couple things I wanted to uh, say about that one, a couple questions okay. there. I want to spend a lot more time on uh, the sayings of Synesius, yeah, but good. let's just talk in general right now so that I think this will be nice for people who are, who are kind of looking for a way to connect and see like the relevance um, about the what it means for what the Midwest, what, what, what it means to you. Now, obviously you're from there. You grew up there. So you're just no, 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 you're writing no, no, about no. what you know. Actually, no, no, I didn't grow up here. Um, I moved here um, in my early twenties. Uh, oh, no I'm kidding. Where are you from? Uh, the New York metro area. Oh, no way. Oh yeah. man. Oh, I don't know how I feel about that. I thought I had like <laughs> a real Midwestern, well, the yeah. voice of the Midwest, not this, cultured new york yes, i know carpet you know i um i you know what i i um i think the the strength though that that i get from that is the move is that i'm looking at it in a way um that you can only see something that you haven't always you know it, it, you're kind of outside of your own uh experience in your formative years so you actually see the things that that are specific to the place in a way that for example there are things about the new york area and new jersey and connecticut that I think probably I don't see, but that say someone from the West Coast uh, would immediately, you know, pick up on. Oh, it's interesting that you guys do this here. You know what I mean? Um, so I think there's something to be said. Now, granted, there's something to be said about someone who's writing about their own, uh, like you said, uh, home. But but I like the idea that I'm sort of an interloper. You know, I mean, <laughs> I think it gives me a, a unique uh, take a little bit. Um, but I did choose. Uh, I, I love Chicago. I, that's another thing we could talk about. The 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 kind of it's a little bit political, but the decline of our our big cities right now, particularly in the North and the Midwest. Um, but I love Chicago and moved there. Um, I could have gone to grad school either in New York or, or Chicago and I chose Chicago partly because I love the city. Um, right. And so it's it's part of the reason I chose to write about it originally. And I do write about other parts of the Midwest too, but uh, is because it's, it's really a great American city that is being slowly um, destroyed by a lot of bad and ridiculous decisions on the part of our political leadership. And it's hard to right. watch that, so. Right. Right. Uh, okay. Well, now, now, you, now you threw me in several different directions at once. So, so we're both we're both coastal elites discussing. Yeah, the, I know. You know but it's you terrible. know, it's funny. I'm um I I'm I'm a, a Californian, but um but I I identify pretty strongly with the rural landscape um mm. because I, I there is actually such a thing as rural Southern California. I know that sure. people are probably surprised to to hear that you know because so much of Southern California is a paved over is just an endless sea yeah. of strip malls. Um, and I, and, and I grew up sure is, around yeah. plenty of that too, but, but, yeah. but my, my actual home is, is a, is a rural part of, uh, of SoCal. Um, mm. what about you? Are you from like New York city or like, uh, outside of it? Like, where did you actually? Uh, no, my family's near, was nearby, but, uh, by the time I was in high school, we were in a pretty suburban, uh, area. And All it's right. the same thing. It's a lot of strip malls, a lot of uh, <laughs> depressing American decay, you know. So, so here's an interesting thing, then. Here's an interesting thing. What unites us is the strip mall from yeah. one coast to the other, <laughs> all true. the way through, all yeah. the way through. You know, I mean, that is an authentic American experience, whether you're a West Coaster, East Coaster or Midwester, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my in my angrier moments, I refer to the country as a coast to coast strip mall. Actually, that sometimes sometimes I feel that that's what it's becoming. It's really that's a depressing thought, but uh, not not inaccurate, I think. Yeah. Now, now and you've been so you've been out there for a while. I imagine you've got to meet a lot of people who who did grow up there. You've got friends mm -hmm. and stuff. I mean, it, it, is that a sort of a, a common theme that you would say 
like unites us in, in, in a sense, just the emptiness of the consumer culture that does span this continent from sea to shining sea? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, actually, you know, uh, my one of my closest friends grew up in a, in a, a Rockford, Illinois, which is a, a, a small city outside of about uh, I think an hour and 20 minutes outside of Chicago. And uh, we talk about when I've been out there with him, um, you know, how it, how much it resembles New Jersey. He, he's a friend of mine who actually lived in New York City for a long time. So we can we, we come from the opposite places, but we've both lived uh, in each other's, uh, you know, where, where each other grew up. So we can kind of make these comparisons. And we always talk about how you could spin me around, blindfold me and plot me down in parts of, you know, a suburban Illinois. And I couldn't tell you if it was New Jersey or Illinois. <laughs> And that's, yeah, so there's I, something I very universal about it. And the only reason I could tell you in S Southern California would be the, the palm trees or the, you know, the, the, the something like that. But otherwise, it's very similar, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, and our more architecture. More, well, more, yeah, and it, exactly. More and more, the way you differentiate different parts of the country is the, the landscape, uh, natural landscape, you know, a, a certain type of tree, or if you're in the desert, you can see. But the corporations are all the same. The the big box stores are all the same. The uh, logos. It, it, yeah, everything is. I mean, you know, the interstate looks the KFC. same. You get off. <laughs> yeah, the KFC, right? Um. So, uh, speaking about nature for a moment, um, I, that was something that I was curious. At. Like I said, because I sort of tend to identify with like the rural setting. Um. Although, I mean, I've been. Uh, I I think of it as in, in exile. I've been living in exile in the uh, L.A. and Orange County area for the last. Uh, I don't even want to know how long. Like mm. too long. Um, uh, but, but like, I'm like longing for that, uh, that Zion of the, the, the lost, yeah. uh, rural landscape. Um, you, you, I get a real strong urban vibe from all your writings. Is that, is, mm -hmm. how do you relate to nature? Is it something important to you? Are you, are you more like, are you, do you feel more at home in an urban setting? Well, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I am, I mean, I, I am an urbanite for sure. I've lived most of my, uh, definitely all my adult life and most of my life in, in a, a more or less an urban setting. Um, but I do, I, it's complicated because it, were we not in the process of disintegration with, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure you've been following the news the last few years where particularly the Midwest, our cities are getting increasingly violent and dysfunctional. So yeah. it, it's hard to, to be a kind of confirmed urbanite in the circumstances, but but yeah, my heart is sort of in the city. It always has been. Uh, I spent a lot of time in in uh, in New York growing up and uh, Philly, and then I moved out to Chicago a long time ago and lived there for a long time and so forth. And so, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a go out at three a.m. and and get a cup of coffee kind of guy. That's just how I've always been. And I, I like you know I like going to the woods here and there. With a, we'll go a friend of mine and I go hiking once or twice a month, but it's always as a kind of tourist. I'm not. Uh, yeah. you know, I wouldn't want to get lost overnight. Let's say that I wouldn't have the tools to. <laughs> that so it's it's interesting uh, because I feel like um, for people who appreciate cities, um, it's like and because I can I can appreciate aspects of of urban life um, in Southern California. It's difficult uh, to it's difficult because the way that our cities are structured here, there's so much congestion and traffic. It's so hard to move around that you mm. never really have the sort of experience that you would have in like. New York or or Boston or like um, you know I'm trying to think of cities I've visited, lots of cities in Europe where you can get around easy, mm -hmm. and so you're able to ex you, you, just the ease of movement gives you a totally different um, you know experience uh, the pedestrian experience versus the driving experience in LA and Orange County and now even in San Diego County it's just uh, it's it's increasingly uh, you know, it's just stressful moving from yeah. this place to that. And it takes all day. Like people come to visit me, they want to see LA and, you know, I'm like, all right, we can see maybe two things, you know, choose because <laughs> it's going to take us all day to drive from one to the other. But, yeah. um, but, but uh, that aside, that aside, mm -hmm. what you should be able to get from a city, I think, it, you know, from, from urban life, what, what I imagine you urban types like about it um is yeah. that i don't know that they're, they're centers of culture right or they have been or they were right like, yeah but, uh, but actually i i wouldn't discount the the the, the uh, point you just made uh you know chicago gets a rep as a kind of sp sprawling city and it is to some degree but it's nothing like los angeles i mean you can get around with that i i i don't have a car right now i i didn't have a car for probably the first eight ten years i lived here uh it's not a um 
you know, the, the train runs. It's that's actually one of the pleasures of it is that I, you know, you can walk outside, hop on a bus or a train, and you don't have to think yeah. about parking and 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 traffic, and you can read and look out that, the window. That's alien to someone from Southern California. I am, yeah, yeah, my, my, yeah. A long term girlfriend of mine is from. Um, uh, I won't tell exactly where, but somewhere in the in the uh, L.A. Uh, area, and uh, we've talked we talked about that a lot. She moved to Chicago for grad school, and the contrast we've been out there, and the contrast is tremendous. Yeah, um, yeah. But but also, you're right. The culture. Uh, the problem with the culture issue, though, now is that so much of the culture is is has to reflect official sort of politically correct um, viewpoints. So it's you know you get you get a little bit bored of the modern uh, contemporary exhibits. You know what I mean? Um, you yeah. I, I, I used to go to art shows and stuff and I don't do that anymore because it's all just the same tedious um, you know, yeah. crap. Yeah, no, I, I, I get you there. Yeah, I, it, it is. And there, there's a lot I could say about um, museums and the museum experience. Yeah, the way that they're redoing the um, LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art mm -hmm. is, um, really disappointing they're, they're tearing down the the old building that has been there and making a new building that will hold like i want to say like only 70 percent of like the collect like so like there's like they're actually making a smaller space for, that less of the art will be on display wow. in. and they're like um they're gonna like scatter it all like rather than having like you know right how it how it has been like you could go and you could you could go into the room that has like all the art from india and you can mm -hmm. and you can take in this vibe of like Indian sculpture and like Hindu art, and you can go and experience Europe in the 1800s or what you know, and and all the mm -hmm. modern art or you know, and the contemporary art that's not the modern, you know, like all these. It's it's like just like how museums generally are laid out, yeah. and, and but they're gonna mix it all up in the big postmodern oh, mismatch. So that, oh, uh, God. Yeah, because you know, desegregate the art. I guess. Oh God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just it's like, no, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. I, I guess, you know, like, uh, I, I, I'm not afraid of labels. I, we can call it wokeism. I think yeah. that's a fine way to refer to a sort of the, the sure. dominant thread of our culture right now. Yeah, well, I like that because, uh, you know, I have friends who are like legitimately left on the left politically. And, and, and so I don't like when I hear everyone, I have a lot of, we have conservative friends on social media and so forth. And they like to say the left, the left. Yeah, I mean, I get that. It is the left in some sense, but it's not really the left in any recognizable way. It's not working class oriented. It's not labor oriented. It's it's um it's it really does feel much more like a kind of boutique um, ideology, and and it, it really is more about political correctness uh, and identity than anything to do with with traditional left. Not that I'm a leftist, but at least let's be honest about you know what it is. Let's categorize things properly. It it's... deserves its own name. Yeah, I find, yeah, I find it so strange because I feel like the, what it really serves is neoliberalism more than anything. Exactly. A hundred percent. I could I couldn't agree more. In fact, when I try to explain my, my political views to people, sometimes to uh, stay away from the whole left right conversation, I, I like to just say I, I'm against neoliberalism. That's like the core yeah. of my political that's, views. That's you know? uh, that's pretty that's pretty good as a descriptor for, for my position, too. In fact, um, it's interesting because this ties into what we were talking about earlier with the decay of the Midwest. And again, it's, I feel like it's funny for, you know, two guys from the, the coast to be like lamenting for the Midwest, but I guess, you know, like I, I had the experience of being that hardcore committed lefty and kind of coming through the whole cycle mm. and, uh, and, you know, seeing like how awful it was when I, I was one of those people who thought of it as, you know, fly over country or whatever. And I guess right. my interest in it now is born of a, like a desire to atone. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like sure. a deep need to like atone for that bullshit that I, that I fed into when I was in that mind frame. But, um, but, but, but before I get too distracted here, neoliberalism sure. uh, and, and in particular outsourcing is, yeah is is one of the main things that created the decay in the midwest wouldn't you say oh absolutely i mean and it's not you know people like to think of it as like O'Gary, indiana or anderson or something but you know the south side of chicago was very industrial detroit obviously um it's it's it actually destroys big cities too it's not like it's just these little rust belt towns it's both and i think that's a that's an important thing to notice because you know one of the some of the pathologies that are going on in chicago for example are not i'm not on the left, so I don't buy the argument that it's simply a matter of, of losing jobs as if that can be the only causal explanation of crime. However, it doesn't help 
that all the industrial jobs are gone and there aren't a lot of options for people who aren't uh you know particularly well educated and so forth learn to so, code man just yeah i code. was thinking that exactly <laughs> exactly well uh um yeah i mean yeah uh, well, so I'm not sure it. that answers your question, but the, the point is like, you know, and I was on the left when I was a, a kid too. And uh, what's actually funny about it is I remember the, the old leftists were against NAFTA. That was the thing that has switched. One of the many things where now, if you think NAFTA was a disaster, you're on the right politically. But growing up, if you were against NAFTA, you were on the left politically for the most part, you know, unless you're right. a Papi Cannon or something. Um, so Another reason yeah. why I, I, you know, I say I'm anti neoliberalism more than left or right because there are plenty of intelligent leftists who who still are uh, against you know offshoring and outsourcing and all that sort of stuff and the the, the free trade deals that have, you know, really ruined uh, uh, life for a lot of working class Americans. Sure. Yeah, I uh, I just hit I just hit some interesting uh, resistance to uh, you know to to my opposition to neoliberalism on uh, on uh, online. Um, you know, from some libertarians. So it is interesting to suddenly get a little jolt of uh, realize, you know, just where I, I don't know. Um, dang it, my my th- <laughs> my 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 tra- my train of thought is derailed. I think I want to go to something that's a little more uncomfortable to talk about before going back to just um, like I'd, I'd like to just sort of like settle into really going deep into uh the sayings of uh Synesius. but okay. but since we're since we're on the subject of politics left right uh and all that but you know i wanted to ask you about what it's like being your your uh uh white male right i'm not i don't see you <laughs> I, don't, I don't know yeah but I'm, sure yeah i'm polish so yeah i'm a polar yeah, yeah. What it what it what it's like to be an, a a white American male sounds young from the voice I don't know uh, trying to get into to be published today mm. I, I'm thinking in particular about a quote um, in a now infamous quote from Joyce Carol Oates um, that uh, you know that sure. came out on Twitter I, I think it was last year right Yeah I know what you're talking about yep. I'm talking about um, about uh, uh, you know publishing houses sort of being uh, yeah. You know, unwilling to publish uh, young white male or yeah, she and, says her, her, I guess her friend, any white male who's not already famous, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is, right. Because if they're already famous, then they're going to make money. And so that's OK. That kind of atones for the privilege. But, uh, you know, if um, if you're young, then, you know, I mean, I think she phrases it as something like my, my friend who works in the publishing. Isn't that what it was? My friend who works in yeah. publishing or something right. like that. Um, in other words, she's saying, I have it on good authority from the inside that this is what, you know, I don't want to say that I'm saying it, but I know that it's true. That's kind of her thing. Right. Um, it's definitely true. You you can go to, I mean, I think the test is you go to the bigger literary agencies and when you're submitting a manuscript, you're supposed to usually pitch it to a specific agent, not to um, an agency as such. And what you do is you you go through the bios of all the uh, of the agents, right? And you find that the major the great majority are overtly woke. They have their pronouns. They talk about privilege. They they want to center this word that people love now. They want to center uh, stories of people of color, whatever. Um, they use all the the um, the talking points, all the the cliche uh, phrases, and so forth. Uh, and then there's a, there may be a few in each agency who don't seem particularly woke, but you know the idea that they're going to go against all their colleagues, especially if they're you know junior agents or something. Uh, it's pretty easy, in other words, to see how how correct that interpretation of uh, Joyce Carol Oates actually is, just based on the gatekeepers in the in the um, you know in the world of uh, agencies. Forget yeah. getting you forget even getting it to a publisher where there's sensitivity readers. And if the publisher thinks you're, you know, not um, politically correct enough, they might just say, no, no, we're not interested. But just to get it, just to get an agent, you've got to either be, um, you know, well, you've got to basically be woke. I mean, I guess that's that's really what it looks like. Right. Yeah. It's, so, you know, it's it's interesting to me. Like I, 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 I see myself as primarily a painter. I know you don't get to choose how like posterity will remember you. And if Mm. posterity remembers me at all, I guess I should be, you know, grateful. (laughs) Sure. Um, But I'm also, I'm also a writer. I probably write more than I paint because I I write every day. And, um, Mm. and I, um, I, I was uh, looking to, to get something published 
a few years ago, and I was starting to send out in, uh, inquiries every day, not to publishing houses again, because like you said, you, you can't get, you used to be able to go direct to certain publishing mm -hmm. houses, not all of them, but some of them, they had all right. closed doors by the time that, you know, I was kind of looking to, to uh, looking at this as an option. And so I was going to agents, just like you said, and, um, you know, and you gotta, you gotta be ready to get like tons and tons of rejections. But I, I stopped after just like a few, I just, I just mm -hmm. kind of got like really irritated. Partly, I think, partly, I think just because I value so much what I wrote, what, what uh, this book is that like, I'm like, I don't want it. I don't even want to yeah. give someone else the chance to, to, to turn their nose at it. Um, but then I think I was also sensing deep down that, that this was, this was, uh, this was there. And I think, you know, this was, um, probably in like 2019 when I was doing this and I don't think it was even as bad then. And just over the years, I, 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 that, that sense of just gotten so strong that like, I felt like, you know, there's really no point in me even, right. you know, trying to get, try, I, I don't even want to, try, I don't want I don't want to give people the chance to, to turn that. I know that's a horrible. Um, no, you, you but I understand it leaves a, a bad taste in your mouth. The whole thing. It, it, but it, you got to have a thick skin. You get, if you want to play the game, you got it. You absolutely, but that's in the old days. Like, uh, exactly. You, I was just going to say, yep. It, it, it'd be one thing to say, okay, look, I got to have a thick skin. I'm going to get rejections. If this was, you know, you know, in the seventies or something, or, or, you know, when Philip Roth was starting earlier. It, well, maybe, but definitely up up till you know um, when we were younger. Uh, because then you think, okay, look, it's not going to be easy. People are going to reject me, but at least I'm getting a fair shake with some of them. I know they're really interested in literature as literature, not as political virtue signaling. So exactly. then you say, okay, look, if I you know if I send out enough, I have a chance. And then if I get rejected, maybe I'm really not that good. I think the problem with, and I have a lot of friends in the in the art world and in the or they're sort of in the art world and in the literary world who are coming to the same conclusion, which is that. It's one thing to, you know, get get the news that you're not as good as you think you are or something if you actually trust the system and the gatekeepers. It's a completely other thing to feel that you're submitting your work to people who hate you because of your perceived politics or identity and therefore are never going to give you a fair shake. And so then why would you value their input in any way, right? Or that's certainly how everyone seems to be taking it. I think that's the right way to look at it. Exactly. So so you know, that, that, where does that leave you? That leaves you in a position where, you know, you've got to find these sort of very, I don't know, counterculture, subculture type of places that increasingly don't seem to exist in the world. Like, I mean, I mean, when I was a kid, I think it was the end of subculture, like subculture was still a thing. And I got to, I got the tail end of it. I got to mm -hmm. see a little bit of it before it evaporated. And it's, it just, over the last 20 years, like, I don't think there has been any real subcultures, not like there was when I was at, when I was a, a kid, because um, I think just like po popular genres took over in a way that they hadn't had a stranglehold, like in the nineties and eighties uh, and, and before. And, um, and, and, you know, the commercialization of culture yeah. was streamlined in such a way that, you know, all cultural, and at the same time, you had these market forces that, you know, you could say are just neutral, like, you know, uh, being the music industry just didn't pay as much to as many people, because sure. you could get music for free. And things started happening, you know, uh, you know because but, of the but, internet. Um well, let me ask you, but, you know, I, I'm not sure how old, how old you are, but when I was growing up in the, in the well, I, I'll just say I'm going to be 40 next year. So there's my age. Oh, we're so, about okay. the same age. I'm, I'm a, I got a couple of years on you. Okay, cool. Forward. Well, so then you'll remember w when Hot Topic became a thing. And, uh, yes, of course. So that, I mean, so, so the, the drive to make every, to, to seize everything, you know, for the for corporate America to seize uh, a subculture and turn it into a profit generating uh, uh, entity, that's not particularly new with social media, but it does seem to have gone into, into overdrive. I mean, you know, there's a difference between the Hot Topic t-shirt thing and uh, the kind of immediate, because there was always a lag too, right? Like when we were kids, some yeah. punk band or some grunge band or something would come out and then a few years later there'd be a version of it regurgitated back through the, the sort of popular media but now it's that's a, that's a fascinating thing the lag between what happens on the street and and how they how they reify it and and then sell it yeah. back to you well um, because but, the, the lag is the difference be, was we perceived it as a difference between something vaguely authentic and something already kind of corporate 
owned and uh, you know um, already dead. Whereas now, if there's no lag, it's very difficult for younger people, especially, to to say, okay, here's the difference between my interest and this sort of corporate version of it. I don't know that there is a difference anymore. So, so, so these these spaces that I'd like to see that, like, I mean, okay, so you know, I I read your um, I read your story on Terror House magazine. Sounds mm -hmm. like. This website, at least, is like one an outlet sort of like that, right? Yeah, yeah. They're one of the few that I like. That not that I like everything they publish, but I like some of it, which is a hell of a lot better than uh, most of the mainstream literary magazines, which have all pretty much gone uh, gone south. I, I haven't even really delved too deeply into them. I just noticed that they had a mm -hmm. bit of that punk aesthetic, a bit of that feeling of you know, fuck the system. Uh, you know, I or kind of like not, not the system. This sounds so juvenile. Just like you know that 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 attitude of like pushback against uh, yeah, you know the yeah. uh, <laughs> well they're they're mission they're mi it's a, I mean it's been a while since I read it but they have a kind of uh, I don't know if it's a mission statement but you know they're about section it's um they're explicitly not political you know I think they're they're just like, aggravated by political correctness and censorship so their view is just we want good writers we don't really care if you're left or right and they seem yeah. to mean it um, but there aren't a lot of those places unfortunately there are a few. That's the one I like the most, but so, so um, you know, yeah. I I'm waiting for these things to pop up. I want, I need to see this. Like it's got to yeah. be like I want to be part of that, right? Um, and then my the fear is is that they just won't. They're not going to be there, or they'll be so small that they, they won't get the circulation like uh, you right. know that that they deserve or or that could be there. I don't know I, if the I, answer I think... is like. Yeah, I think it's starting, though, because I think what happened was for a long time, people were just trying to kind of wait out what they thought was maybe a temporary uh, woke phase at, at other places, you know, at other magazines or or whatever it is. Um, you know, with I have friends who are in the art world, like I said, and for them, it was getting gallery shows was the thing. And then th they, they sort of noticed that becoming corrupted and becoming politicized. And so there was an idea that if we waited out a little while or push back hard enough, we don't have to sort of start new institutions. But I think now we're at the point where people have given up on that strategy um, yeah. because it's just too, um, you know, the, the, the control is so complete by ideological uh, folks that it, you, you kind of have to do your own thing, it seems like. What, um, we, I think we we had spoken a little bit about, um, you know, this this blogger, Mencius Moba, Curtis Yarvin uh, before, mm. and you know, I, I was sort of intrigued by him when I found out about him like a year ago and looked in, you know, he, he's got this allure because he's kind of like I mentioned in, a, in an article recently, he's kind of a thought criminal. And I mean, he goes and dances on the edge of like, uh, you know, of the, mm -hmm. the what's acceptable. And, um, you know, that just feels exciting now. But then, of course, the danger is dancing over the edge and dancing into like, you know, literal like, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I checked, I, I heard him mention a publishing company that was like, you know, kind of like what I'm saying I want to see, you know, like this punk rock aesthetic, this rebellious kind of, we're going to do it. And I, I went on and, and I clicked on their, uh, you know, I, I clicked on their website and I just saw a bunch of like stuff about Nazis. And like, I just mm. immediately, you know, like, I, I don't know if some of that stuff is them trying to be cheeky and they don't mean it, but it right. kind of doesn't matter. As if, if you're just seeing like tons of stuff yeah. about Nazis, like that's um, going to turn yeah. off most <laughs> sane people, you know? And uh, so yeah, there's, I, there's a lot like, of that edgy stuff though, isn't there? I mean, you know, in Twitter now that, that Musk is, is running it and it's more free in theory, you really do see that some, some of the stuff is like, you, you can play footsie, I guess, with, with some of these things for a while, but you know, I think it's more, I think a lot of them are really young and they just want to seem like they're pushing the envelope like you said and that's i understand that but the problem is there's nothing substantive there it's just a kind of like look at, let's see who can who can be edgier than the last guy you know i mean yeah like it just like it it's it's definitely sad if that's if that's the only space there is to yeah. retreat to you know, I, I mean, I, like it really doesn't. And I feel like that's kind of what the woke, the wokest uh, uh, neoliberal wokest overlords would like is that that yeah. is literally the only island. Right. Well, they, they, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that's kind of it's, ideal for them. You're with us that's, or you're with the Nazis and there's exactly. no way. Yeah, that's what they I think that's what they think a lot of the woke people. And I think that's what they want, because it's then it's a lot easier to say, 
you see, like you said, you see, you see how bad these people are, you, you know. Um, but I also think it's just the inevitable result of people growing up in our cult, you know, in our sort of anti-culture. And yeah. uh, there's nothing really to, you know, there's nothing really to grab onto. Uh, and so people get lost in these bizarre internet subcultures. Yeah, yeah. So so going back to the, the topic of being too online and, uh, you know, there's like one of the big things that we saw in the 70s and 80s was like with talking about punk, for instance, was like mm -hmm. it was all IRL. It was all in real life. It was people yeah. meeting in person. And I feel like we we need that. You know, if we don't have some, um, you know, if the whatever spaces are going to form to be a pushback, an authentic pushback to wokeism that isn't like, you know, totally deranged, uh, you know, yeah. uh, tiki torch, tiki torch <laughs> style. Um, yeah. the, the, that has to have a, an, an in, in real a IRL component, in, you know, yeah, in I real life. Uh, yeah. I want, I, I think like that, I mean, and, and just conceptually, you know, the put so much of the pushback, I feel like needs to be a, against this culture that sucked us all into this, uh, you know, estranged online existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the problem though is that you meet people and they live all over the. I mean, like this. So we live in completely different areas, and you meet. You know, I, I've met uh, some people on uh, social media that I've become friends with, but unfortunately, most of them don't live anywhere near me. And so that's sort of yeah. the problem with the in real life dimension is that you can choose to go visit someone, or or if you happen to be traveling for work or something, you can stop and have a beer with somebody you met. You know, somebody you met on Facebook or Twitter. But um, unfortunately, a lot of it's a lot of pe scattered people. Um, yeah, you know. And it, and it's a two edged sword. Like the 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 nice side is I get to talk to someone like you who's who's got work yep. that I'm really interested in, and you know I wouldn't have I wouldn't have come across it if you were just, uh, you know, like uh, uh reading it in uh, bookstores in Chicago. Um, but yeah. um, if I was reading but, it in a bookstore in Chicago, I don't think it would go well for me. But that's, that's another. <laughs> well, maybe the sayings of Cinesius. It doesn't. Is there anything in there that's like too that the uh, no, the, the it's, it's I don't Bernie know. Book? See. I don't know where the, the line is anymore, you know. I, I think that's the good news is that the line is so preposterous now that they're getting, you know, I think more people are sort of defecting from from that yeah. uh, call. But in any case, no, I maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but there is definitely a sense in which if you want to be part of a, the literary community, such as it still stands, you you, you have to be part of uh, our, you know, not our, but uh, their uh, um, uh, cults, really, I think, you know. And, and that's yeah. the other thing. To get back to the whole question of what, you know, writing about the Midwest, um, so many contemporary writers, they, they write about their little milieu in, you know, the, you know, the Upper West Side or something in, in Manhattan. That's the whole, that's their whole world, the literary cliques, you know, I don't know if you read that Alex Perez uh, interview that was a big deal a while back in Hobart, uh, Pulp, but he talks about that. The, the Well, he talks about him as the Brooklyn literary ladies. And, uh, you know, now that's the hit place to live is Brooklyn and not Manhattan. But the point is they're, they're kind of upper middle class and upper class um, clique. Uh, of uh, moralistic woke scolds and and uh, so to be in the literary community you pretty much have to be um, acceptable in their sight I think that's the yeah. thing so so there so a re so a hypothetical reading in Chicago would probably proceed along the same lines is sort of my my point I guess so you you haven't actually gone out into like you know uh, in well I mean I guess we've all been we've been closed down for a long time but I don't know how yeah. it's like if like are there things happening out on the street like readings literary scene mm. that you don't you don't feel like there's a really anywhere to meet up with real people out there my my sense is that most of the stuff that's going on is part of the approved culture so you have especially in the art world which i used to do a lot of i used to like 20 years ago i'd go to you know openings and things and 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 that just has has really took, taken a nosedive for the quality of that stuff so yeah. So maybe like if you wanted to write poetry about how good it feels to kiss black women's asses, you <laughs> might be able to find a place to 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 participate in. But yeah, not if you're not doing that. I I also think it's lost popularity for the simple reason that people perceive contemporary writing, poetry in particular, as as just unbearable and and not interesting in the slightest because they're getting you know and this goes back to before the whole woke thing started and i think it's also why the woke people had such an easy job of getting into positions and in control which is that american writing wasn't really 
I wasn't really um, doing very well for, for a while before all the politically correct stuff came in. I think that's why a lot of the politically correct stuff came in. You had a lot of tedious confessional writing, you know, everybody talking about their little epiphany in the laundromat and that sort of thing. And people really, really didn't care, you know. And so um, and so what happened is as the transition from that to, uh, you know, wokeism occurred, it was easy to uh, people just pulled back and didn't really you know, it wasn't a big loss. In other words, it wasn't like they were, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, yeah. I feel, and I feel like now either you're a true believer in, in wokeism and you write about that, or you're just petrified that they're going to tear you to pieces for whatever little per, mis, you know, perceived misstep that yeah. you say it wrong. I think people are petrified to express themselves right now, which is, Right. You know, I mean, maybe that's maybe that's part of what's going on. I want to qualify something that I said, uh, you know, sure. I, I firmly, firmly believe in kissing black women's ass if it's in real life. I just don't believe in doing it metaphorically. OK, I just want to sure. lot of black women, really nice asses that deserve to be kissed. Um, I just will not. Well, I can never do it now because I'm married, but I, oh, you know, even. I will not do it metaphorically. Okay? <laughs> I don't believe in doing it metaphorically. Do it in real life, people. It's good, but don't do it metaphorically. All right. Um. But but so so, yeah. No, I feel a similar thing in the LA area. Like I I I've got a book that um I'm trying to uh oh, I've been okay. I've been trying to uh, uh get it ready for you know self publishing and uh, mm -hmm. I'm tinkering tinkering with it right now and. Uh, once it's ready, I want to go out and, you know, do some in real life kind of readings. Sure. But man, you know, you imagine the LA area, I, can, I just feel like I bet I, I got to like be ready to get in some fist fights or something. Yeah. Well, I wonder, I mean, not even because, not, not even because I say, and everything I wrote, everything I wrote in here, I wrote as a left wing liberal. Yeah. And like, it's like, it's all it is, is just that there's no, there's no, that there's, there's nothing left wing in there because I, I've never been inspired to write about well, at least in those days, I wasn't inspired to write about politics. Yeah. Um, so, you know, once I, I had a big political shift, I didn't really have to change anything in, in that book because sure. it's, all, it's more timeless type of stuff. But just my, just being myself, I feel like just me being me in, in a public context where art is expected, where artsy people are Right. And like, like, you know, like you're, if I don't start with uh, indigenous land acknowledgement, yes. or something, you know, I feel yeah. like it's going to end in a fist fight. So I, I just, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, it feels yeah, like a really, but part of me kind of, part of me kind of like, you know, you wants want to go fight. and experience yeah. it anyway. Well, but you know, the other thing is, at least with uh, with fiction, you can't write convincing characters within the, the current, uh, you know, um, allowable range or whatever because you can't say anything about you know uh not that you want to write explicitly men are different than women and here's why but if you're going to write a convincing couple or a convincing uh, argument between a man, a man and a woman you can't pretend to believe a lot of the um, bizarre gender ideology or something and so that doesn't produce art at all it produces these really really um empty types uh that are all pre-approved but if you really want to write fiction that's psychologically true or accurate you, you, you can't you just can't you're you're already out of bounds, right? And so, not, not only that, but people's motivations are not what um, you know the woke schools want them to be. I mean, basically, what it is is that reality is a much uh, messier business than the woke ideology would allow. And so, even if you don't think you're writing anything even vaguely political, uh, you'll find that in some way it's politically incorrect simply because you're acknowledging you know basic human behavior. I guess <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point because reality doesn't conform to the expectations of wokeism anything that you write can be interpreted in a very postmodern analytical way as you know they they can read into it whatever they want to you know to find bigotry where yeah to make know, it right wing because also right. they believe everybody is right wing at this point which is also why i think those terms have become kind of meaningless at least in our culture i mean you know bill maher is right wing now right and uh, every, you know people, people who are disaffected liberals are right wing so i mean that yeah that's why i came out as right wing because i figured i'll just get ahead of it i didn't feel like i was right wing. <laughs> I, I was just yeah. like i'm just gonna tell everyone i'm right wing and then like you know what what do you do with that it's like you're not yeah. a good leftist anymore no i'm not i'm right wing <laughs> it's like yeah. there you go removed, 
and I lost some friends and it hurt. It really yeah. hurt. And and I still worry, you know, about the some few connections that I have. But I just figure like, you know, I got yeah. it was like in a band-aid or something. And then eventually I actually started feeling like, oh, maybe I actually am right wing, at least within the current Overton window. Sure. I don't care. Like that's the thing, that's the freedom of not caring. Like I don't care whether yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm right. Where I'm especially yeah, especially in the sense of what people are going to consider you right now. It's it's it seems like a, the last thing anyone should care about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. So um, so uh, Panerj, I uh, I can't man, I can't say that and take myself seriously. You got <laughs> it has to be the American pa- pronoun Panerj. Sure, Pan-urge. you can do that. All right, yeah. all right. That's okay. So, so we've been talking for a while. Um, I want to get into some of the nuts and bolts, the meat, the actual artistic merit of the sayings of uh, Sinesias. And um, so I just want to, I want to dive back there if, if you're good with that. Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So um, I have more questions I want to ask. Okay, really quick before we get into it. Did did you study creative writing or did you study something else? No, I didn't study creative writing. Um, I did study, uh, as an undergrad, I did uh, English and philosophy. So, um, but, you know, one of the things that, uh, even at the time, um, I remember thinking that the, the MFA programs were kind of not the place to go if you really want to be, um, <laughs> because, it, do it, have- you know, they, well, I mean, look, there are exceptions that I, I know people who, who went to them, but they, they have a tendency to produce. Uh, it's a kind of a mass produced item. So you get, you get a lot of voices that sound very similar and the interests that are very similar and everything else, you know. Did, did you happen to see the thing I wrote recently about MFA programs? No, I didn't actually. Oh, you have to send oh, it. Oh, okay. you click like on that article, but um, I. Oh, maybe uh, I did. Oh, maybe I did. Sorry. I, I, there's so many. I, I get through. Yeah. Okay. I, um, yeah. I, I, I said, uh, I said that, um, you know, I, I called for all MFA programs uh, okay. and all participants in all MFA programs to be locked in their respective de- departments and burned alive with a, <laughs> with a footnote that I didn't mean it. With a oh, I do know that. that. Okay. Yes. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's inevitable because you, you really should only take seriously the critiques of people you respect and, the idea that you're going to respect the other students in your class, especially when you're in your early twenties, just seems to me kind of ludicrous, just, you know, on its face. Right. I mean, in other words, I have a few people who read my work now um, and they give me good feedback, but if I were to just send it to eight other people that I happen to know, which is the equivalent of sitting in one of those seminars, um, I'd get terrible feedback. And then I'd be, you know, and then then I'd be pressured to take some of it seriously and I, I wouldn't be able to. And that seems to me the whole process there. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's my basic feeling right now is that whatever is coming next, whatever, whatever is going to be interesting, unique and authentic in writing will not be coming from the MFA laboratories of mm-hmm. America. Uh, I know that being said, I had a very, very close friend uh, who was an incredible writer who did go and do one of those MFA programs and, you know, came out of it amazing, but he went in amazing. And so he, you know, yeah, he was just, right. Well, um, that's the, thing. The, the people who will come out amazing didn't need it probably. And the, I mean, I think Flannery O'Connor actually went to one, if I remember correctly, but you know, she, she was Flannery O'Connor. So I think really what that did was just give her a few connections in, in the literary and publishing world back when it was still a, a functioning uh, publishing world. Uh, but anyway, I, I won't, I won't belabor the point. I just realized there was one more thing that I wanted to ask you about, um, uh, which, well, actually, no, this is relevant to the sayings of uh, Sinesias. I keep wanting to say Kinesias. Um, uh, w- there's, a, there's a line um, where the, this, um, does he have a name, by the way, the, the, the no, heroic so. sort of masturbating uh, guru, and he doesn't have a name? <laughs> the uh, Diog- I Diogenes? I, I, I don't. No, I don't think I gave him one. No. Okay. So the unnamed, uh, oh, that people probably don't know the the way that this uh, this cynic philosopher uh, is discovered in the in the manuscript is, uh, you know, his 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 followers come upon him one day as he's masturbating furiously behind a KFC. I think okay. something like that. Um. Anyway. Um. Or behind a Wendy's. Excuse me. <laughs> So uh, uh, he says something to the effect of that, like, 
poetry is not possible in the you know in in today's world uh mm. can you can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit uh well i mean i don't think i meant it seriously but but i do think it, it raises an interesting question because you you, you know um well, I, I kind of feel like I kind of feel like there's many ways in which it's true. This is some as someone who, you, ahead, you know, what, I have to say, I've stopped writing poetry since I started paying it more attention to politics. Being like paying mm -hmm. attention to politics has killed my inner life. Whereas before, when uh, I didn't pay so much yeah. attention, I had a richer inner life and, and I was able to write poetry. Well, yeah. And right. And we have to all get better at tuning out for a while. And just I, I try to like catch up every few days on what's been going on politically, but I try not to look at it every day because you get sucked into those cycles of, you know, and then everyone responds to the news cycle and then you gotta, it's just, a, it's a nightmare. It's pointless and it, and it all becomes irrelevant or most of it becomes irrelevant a week later. So, yeah, but still the question about poetry, I mean, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's a real question what kind of um, art and what kind of literature you get in a society like ours. I think that is a real question, even though I, as I say, I kind of put that a little, that was a little bit um, an over the top way of stating it in the story, but um, you know, it, it's a corporate consumerist culture more than it's ever been. I would argue, um, you know, even, even in the height of the, you know, the eighties and, and all that um, it's, it's an open question. What kind of art and literature you get out of that? Or if our art and literature really just becomes the, the, you know, the stuff that's on uh, Netflix. Yeah. Now, in some sense, I feel like postmodernism was uh, no, uh, now. Now I want to talk about postmodernism in the sense of how, what it's been in the arts. That wasn't was whatever was authentic about postmodernism. It, I think that was authentic, like the 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 pop art, you know, pop art. This 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 becoming conscious of the degree to which our visual materialistic culture makes a joke out of everything right that there's something in that that i feel like is sort of the inescapable this is the trick right there's there's something sort of inescapable about about the degree to which we're aware of how cheesy and corny everything is how 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 there's no how how what a lack of dignity human yeah. life has when it's when everything that encapsulates it is a plastic wrapper with a commercial print on it the, the, uh, yeah yeah no i think that's right um but uh well what was the so what's the question about postmodernism just that it's sort of been sucked of its um vitality in some way or i mean the artistic well, side of it or so like so like i feel really deeply that part of the urban decay that you know you're responding to in your writing contrast that contrast that with the mm. visual environments created by like the the Greco-Roman classical culture that's right, also right. writing, right? Like one of the reasons that I really enjoyed this writing is because it's woven with images of, of that Greco-Roman classical heritage at the same right. time as it's woven with this very postmodern, you know, Wendy's KFC culture. Yeah. You see the disconnect, you know that one is high and exalted and, and has gravitas and dignity um, yeah. And you know that the other is low and base and like, you know, and, and, and evidence is this sort of, uh, you know, lack of meaning and um, there's no resolution. And I feel like right. where we are today is exactly in that complete lack of resolution. No, that's right. I mean, there, there, well, that's, I mean, that's the way I put it. There, there is no resolution there. We certainly haven't found one, um, but I know what you mean. There's also the, you know, you could, you could say that the writing itself is postmodern if you take the sort of typical understanding of what that means in the sense that yeah, there's a blending of high and low and you know all that sort of thing but i think it is, but it would be is, the best the best possible layer of it would be the cream well, at the top of the postmodern swill well i think the difference too is that it's not merely doing that with no purpose just for the sake of play uh, i think there's there's a kind of a it, it's it's satire properly understood there's actually a critique in it it's not just yeah here's the high and the low and isn't that funny it's uh you know i think there's hopefully there's a little more going on there yeah you know what i take that back yeah you're right it's it's not it's not it's you know what it is it's brilliantly close to postmodern it's so close to mm. postmodernism that a postmodernist would drink it down do you know what i mean like that's, they would think oh yeah this, yeah, is, yeah. My, this yeah. is my brew yeah, yeah. And they, right 
<laughs> but they would get the poison pill. Of I would, the, I would of trick the, them. Of yes. the of sincerity, yes, you know that's I mean? right. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I don't know that that was a conscious intention when I wrote it, but that's certainly how it functions, I guess. Um, I like you know, that. and then there's well, and the you know the writing itself. I mean, he imagines the narrator imagines the um, author not unreasonably as perhaps a classicist, right? As perhaps a, a someone who studies uh, someone like uh, him. That's also another really beautiful thing in it is like the longing of the of the narrator's, um, uh, you know, like you can feel that he he wishes he could have met this guy. You know? Right. Yeah. It's almost like a friendship that he didn't that he, he he feels as if he could be friends with this person. He would understand him and that sort of thing. And it evidences the loneliness, I think, that people who are engaged in with these sort of questions often feel. Not, yeah. Maybe not so much these days because, you know, Internet connects us and stuff, but like still yeah. in, in some way, you know what I mean? But like when, when you just look at how many people there are who like us who look at things this way versus just the masses who are right. content to guzzle down the swill you know yeah that's right i mean i think right and the, the, it's a i mean it's lonely from start to finish he's he's by himself in the city like you said he's he's laughing he's sorry I, I love this part he's laughing at the people how, how miserable they are in the cold by himself and then he goes into the library by himself and so on yeah and then you get in the idea is that the writer of the the manuscript, of course, uh, it's at least reasonable to assume was fairly lonely as well in his, uh, and hence his bizarre habit of stuffing his manuscript in random places. <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably what I'll end up doing. Yeah, now. right, <laughs> me too. Uh, All right, hey, so- could, uh, um, could, could we uh, take two? Yeah, well, with, uh, so you were we were talking about the, um, yeah, the loss of the canon and the, and the environment that we're writing about here. Um, I think, you know, the loss of the canon is, or the strip mall rather, is the kind of visual manifestation of our loss of not just the canon, but our loss of uh, uh, culture, you know, our loss of a bigger emphasis on, uh, on our own culture, on preserving our, our heritage and our, uh, our art and our literature and our philosophy and so forth. You kind of, when you empty, when you empty all of that out, you get our plastic uh, uh, landscape. That's a pretty good I would say a kind of a, you know, it's it's a ubiquitous symbol for for everything that we've become, and it's it, essentially it's a hollowing out. Um, does that make question. sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. But but here's here's an interesting thing to consider. So the loss of the canon, the what motivates it, um, you know, say let's say on one level, you know, there might just be that the pure hatred of western culture motivates it right but let, let's actually mm -hmm. like set that aside for a moment because sure. you could legitimately say that like you know when we say our culture our culture like you know if if we're meaning like you know as two white guys if we're meaning like our european culture that we ourselves are directly related to mm -hmm. um you know then that do, I, I see where like, you know, whatever percentage of the American population who it doesn't have European heritage feels like, well, what about my culture? Like, why can't my right. culture be part of this? And um, I, I, I feel a variety of different ways about that. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that it's possible to say, for, say, for instance, like, well, well, well why can't, you know, uh, Hindu literature be part of the American canon if, if you know, there's a big yeah. Hindu population in this part, you, you know what I mean? So like, sure, so sure. like now that can so easily become wokeism and does. Yeah, that's and, the danger, and, yeah. Well, it's, it's not even just, it's beyond a danger, it's happening. That's what's happening. Yeah. The saddest thing is, is that, you know, you can have these interesting, like, you, you could be motivated to incorporate Hindu literature and uh, Persian literature and whatever kind of literature into the canon, into a yeah. new canon, from a pure perspective of just really being fascinated by these different cultures and thinking, oh, that's kind of cool. Let's bring it up. Yeah. Or you can be motivated by the hatred of European culture and the desire to like denigrate it and you know and make these sort of and recast all these other ethnicities in a woke light and the thing that i see so often happening is like people who want to champion uh native american culture or this culture or that culture they put this woke spin on it that doesn't even do justice to the actual cult like yeah kind of ignores yes. it and pretends that 
this culture was always woke. And yeah. It's like, well, that's it. Well, there's two things. I mean, first is that the one you described two different tendencies, right? That there are some people who actually are anti-Western culture and others who just want to bring in, you know, other things, other, other cultures. And I think the problem is that they, uh, the former uses the latter as a kind of useful idiot to, to, yes. to advance their political yes. agenda. Because a lot yes. of people would say, you know, sure, why wouldn't we study? You know, I mean, uh, I, I read a lot of um, you know Japanese literature for, and translation, but you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, it's not like it, most writers are interested in all kinds of uh, uh, you know writing. It's not like we're merely yeah. interested in, in in European writers and so forth. So the problem is that it's easy to use that to sort of smuggle in uh, what we call woke politics, and, and then it becomes yeah. not so much, hey, let's read this other stuff as, hey, let's replace the thing that's actually central to our own culture, which, which gets me to the other point, which is that multiculturalism really is not multiculturalism at all. It's the most inaccurate uh, word for the, the phenomenon. What, really, what, what it does is it, it wants to homogenize everything. So it's not like we're all learning about you know, great Japanese literature or great Hindu literature, whatever it is. It ends up being that everything becomes this sort of empty uh, corporate homogenized Pop, totally. pop culture because the, the Japanese literature or the Hindu literature or whatever is problematic if you really look at well, it. Well, sure, to, absolutely, yeah. and exactly. All the other cultures that we supposedly are being told to love so much are are even less woke than Western culture. So, <laughs> so, so there's an inevitable problem. So, what happens is you say you want to explore. A woke person will say, "I want to explore this, that, and the other thing," but you don't want to do that because then that would make you confront your own uh, assumptions too much. So, it ends up becoming. Um, you know, kind of the opposite of what it advertises itself to be. Yeah, I, 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 my feeling, and I'm working with this, this isn't something that I'm done with, but my feeling is that I want our culture to not be Eurocentric, but also not be anti-European. And, and part of that will, I think, an important part of that is accepting that we are it, like our culture is genetically European. I don't mean genetically in, in like blood. I mean, like mm -hmm. the gene culture memes, I yeah. guess you could in the yeah. old term of what a meme used to be like the, the, the genealogy of our culture, our language, our language is a European language, English, right. European language, and it can be used by people who aren't genetically sure. English. You know, like, and, and it is, of course, and I, and it is. me probably don't have that much English in us. So. I have zero English in me. Yeah. And we're <laughs> I using actually did the 23 in me. So I can tell you for sure. So, um, so, so, so like, you know, our, we can acknowledge that our culture is European and not hate it yeah. and move forward in a way that's open to certain aspects that, that has a permeability to certain aspects, but maintains its strong core. Yeah. Or well, but 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 oh, sorry, we can completely move forward in this total left turn direction that the wokeism seems where it's a complete it must be liquidated the core must right. be liquidated and reconstructed as this whatever mishmash yeah, thing. Yeah, but, but the problem is there's nothing to reconstruct it with. They don't have any constructive um, viewpoint. It's just I mean, they like hate the, certain things. Yeah. It'd be the well, big blob from Stranger Things, the big meat blob. Or, uh, yeah. Well, but the other thing is it takes a lot of effort to master a language, but also to master, uh, you know, a craft, say being a writer, being an artist, but also to just to study a country's literature. So again, if, if multiculturalism were really multiculturalism and it was just encouraging people to study more things, but to study them well, I don't think a lot yeah. of people would have too much of a problem with that, but it doesn't encourage you to study more things well. It wants you really just to use that as an excuse to not study your own uh, literary tradition. Definitely, definitely. Or just study the latest, you know, the latest, um, woke author that's being pushed on you right from uh, whatever yeah, yeah. Else. right or, that's, or, that's or masquerading the... as the authentic voice of whatever culture it's supposed to be and it's right. and it's not it's, it's not it's a woke imitation of that culture they, they, they rely upon people not being familiar with these non-european yes. cultures in order to pass it off as like oh yeah of course this is what it, uh, right here's the quintessential yeah really yeah, well, that's kind of what I was saying. It's this idea that like we don't have any familiarity with anything else, but there's just the kind of approved. Yeah, uh, here's your approved guy. You can read. Here's your Hispanic writer, or here's your black writer, and here's what you should read. And that's not 
that's not worth anything. I mean, that's just, you know, that's the same as what you can listen to on the news. Here's the approved voice on uh, CNN and, and you better take that pretty seriously and, and, and nothing else. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, yeah, I feel a sadness about the loss of the canon. I don't think we need to throw it. I think we have to accept that there needs to be a canon. There always is a canon. Every culture has a canon. We can't yeah. just, you know, throw it all away. I'm open to adding to it and to making yes. it less Eurocentric, but not anti-European or anti what it is. Um, and that's my, that's my basic, my basic perception of it. Um, but let's finish up on this idea of the gatekeeper. Cause once again, it circle, it all circles back to that. I mean, that's, a, we're in a very interesting moment. Mm -hmm. We're in an interesting moment in art and culture and news and everything where this is, I think, the issue of our day is the gatekeeping yeah. And, yeah, and how it's going to be resolved. Because, I mean, on one level, you know, it's obvious, like, it's obvious why some level of gatekeeping is needed. I mean, like, we don't want to have to go to the museum and see a bunch of trash just to get a right. good view of like something that's something that's worth our time. Um, you know, like I, I, I look through all these different things I find and I, and I try to bring on my channel, for instance, people that I think are interesting. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's gatekeeping, not, right. not like my gigantic audience is, uh, you know, a, a, a no, huge but, but, but that's, but it's the quality of it, isn't it? I mean, so uh, of course there's always going to be a gatekeeper. The problem I have with today's gatekeepers are that they're of very low quality. Uh, right. The literary agents, the the, the people who, Absolutely. you know, the, the, the sensitivity readers at the publishing houses who are just basically random people who put their shingle out and say, look, I'm a sensitivity reader on gay issues or I'm a sensitivity reader on, you know, black issues. These aren't people with any achievements behind it. It's just, you know, they are of a certain identity. So they get to speak uh, on behalf of their whole group, which is insane. But um, anyway, so the gatekeepers are just a, a really, really bad quality of the issue. Yeah, so there can be gatekeepers who are committed to quality. There can be gatekeepers who are committed to nepotism and corruption. Yep. And it feels like that's like, or or ideology or all of the above. Yes, right? well, that's what it, it, we went from quality control to ideology, I think. Yeah, I think, and I, think, I, think it's, I think corruption and nepotism are also in there too. I think it's ideology, sure. corruption and nepotism. So I mean, maybe, those, yeah. maybe those other two are always, maybe there's always nepotism and always corruption but it's just so much more in your face when the quality isn't there. right exactly well it's like the old you know like people don't mind corruption so much is, 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 say in city government if the city is safe and the trains run on time i think that's a normal human reaction is to say of course some people are are you know making money off of this in ways that they shouldn't but hey you know it's a safe city the trains run whatever uh same thing in the publishing world i, I don't really care if there's some corruption sure whatever that's just life but the the uh, the quality is so low that, like you said, you notice it more, uh, and it's galling because you know uh, if you're gonna make money off of us, at least you know, <laughs> at least deliver the at least deliver the goods in some way. So so then what it, what it comes around to is that we're at a moment where there is a window for people to bypass gatekeepers, but it's closing. I feel like it's closing. Mm -hmm. And the powers that be are trying to close it as fast as they can. Um, you know, plenty of people slipped through your Joe Rogans of the world slipped through. Yeah. Tim Dillon is someone that I, I really uh, I, I love to listen to. And, you know, he's someone that just kind of also like slipped through. And, you know, he, you've he's got these comedian. Yeah, he's, he's a comedian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, yeah, I know. He's, right. he's hilarious. He's just a really funny guy. Um, yeah. I mean, like uh, all, all kinds of. Um, you know, because of the, the different online platforms and the way they have been structured or were structured before the nooses started to draw, you know, um, it, it allowed for that. They haven't perfected their their means of control yet. I mean, in the sense that, like, you know, there's so mm -hmm. leakage. I feel like whatever I'm aiming for on my YouTube channel, it's it's whatever leakage is still available because, <laughs> I, you know, right. Is, right. So, yeah, I don't know. But what do you think about but that? Isn't that? I mean, I don't know. The hopeful answer is that we have uh, the internet, you know, being what it is, it's hard to really keep all the gates closed. But the, but then the problem is, of course, you get very small magazines or you get very small. Well, now, your example of Rokin's, you know, obviously that's not small at all. So it, it, there's always the potential to break through. But 
but he's, he started out as a uh, whatever, you know, nobody yeah. knew him when he started out. I mean, I didn't. well, but that's the problem. I mean, you could still publish if you're a non woke author, like we said at the beginning of this, uh, there are writers who still publish stuff that you, you're kind of amazed that's getting out. But, and they even remember, I'm not a huge Jordan Peterson fan, but I don't know if you remember, but when one of his books was being, I think a second book was being published, they had um, the, 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 the publishing house, there were a lot of uh, young woke uh yeah. workers there at various levels and they were going to walk out or something they threatened to yeah. walk out if they published it and so but you know he was going to make a ton of money for the publishing house so they said well walk out then you know so yeah but that's that doesn't that doesn't i mean that's that's great i was happy when that happened but like that doesn't yeah. solve our problem no you know i agree I mean? completely but that's what i'm saying it's it only seems to get through and that's only the attitude that kind of brave that you know people were saying oh the brave good for the publishers well sure but the publishers were going to make a, you know a couple million bucks on him so it's not really that big of a heroic act to say, oh, we'll still publish, you know, Jordan Peterson or Joe Rogan or whatever. Yeah, I think we got it. We I, I feel like we've got to do a um, if 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 people like us want to get our stuff out there, there, there has to be like a two pronged attack because, you know, you've got this this these nooses that are tightening around online, you know, spaces yeah. like this. But they can't stop you from meeting in real life unless, of course, you know, you've got your WEF. Um, uh, <laughs> did I, did I, I, I get that confused with the, the wrestling. Did I say that right? The uh, World Economic even know. Forum agenda yeah, yeah, of you yeah. know, keeping everybody as pod people and, uh, you know, whatever right. sort of um, pandemic excuses they want to make for that. Yeah. But Yeah. I think a lot of it gets through, though. I mean, there's so many. It's hard to really throw off everybody who is politically incorrect because this is not it's a pretty big group of people still i mean there are plenty of woke people for sure but there are still it's a huge country it's not just our country it's anyone who can you know speak either english or french or you know and so it's not like it's very difficult to um to push something through because unless you trip up the censors with certain key words or something it's it's pretty easy i think to still uh, publish a short story on, and, and do a YouTube video for now. Um, yeah. And I don't really yeah, know how. They, awesome. Yeah. No, no. I, I'm just saying, I wonder, you know, how tight the news could get in a sense, because how would you go about trying to censor uh, this, for instance? It doesn't seem too big of a threat, well, but I don't know. So, like, um, I think I, I said the F word earlier, and mm -hmm. um, I forgot that now YouTube is like, you know, demonetizing anything that has even a single swear word oh, in wow. it you know? yeah right, and right not like my videos are monetized anyway but you know i mean they 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 definitely they're able to um you know convert all the speech to text uh probably on the back end without even you know right. having you and it's just automatically done analyzed put through it's whatever you know what i mean so they yeah yeah, they certainly, yeah. and once they and if they identify your channel as something that they you know but we, we learned about all this through the twitter sure. files you know about the the, the shadow oh, yeah, it's frightening thing, yeah you know? no no i i don't mean to sorry if I, I don't mean to say uh, to minimize the, the difficulty of it i'm just saying that for whatever reason there still seems to be quite a lot getting out on twitter and on youtube and so yeah, forth and i think that as long as that's true expected. Yeah. yeah, I think we have to take advantage of it as long as that's the situation. Yeah, but don't you think it's exciting to think about getting out in real life too? And I mean, I feel like the characters in your books are all all they 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 they, they pull the reader out into the real world. They they beg for some real world interaction, you know? Yeah. Oh, I under, yeah, I completely agree with you. It's it's uh, but I think that's one of the depressing aspects of our time is that it is so we are so scattered that it's hard to uh, imagine you know, getting uh, getting uh, any kind of in real life stuff together uh, to some degree. That's, um, that's what I like. That's what I like. That's one of the things I like so much about your, 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 I want to call it artwork because that's how I like to think of it. If sure. somebody's really dedicated to, to their creative uh, endeavor, it's, it inspires you to engage with life, to be, to, to be in it. Thanks. And yeah. I, yeah, that's, that's what I want to see more of. That's why the escapism, which was that other thing I wanted to mention, mm. that's why it doesn't, it just doesn't do it for me. I don't want to, I, I read a book. I don't know if you heard of uh, this book, um, Circe that came out a few uh, years ago and it was all just like, you know, it was, it was like kind of interesting until the end and it sort of fell apart. 
but it was just like um it was like a fantasy novel set in you know with all mythological you know it was like yeah. a fantasy novel did you, did you read this one or hear about it uh no i didn't but uh sounds it's familiar, escapism right? and it's enjoyable yeah. but it doesn't it doesn't doesn't take me all the way do you know what i mean oh yeah i know what you mean um and that's also the problem with a lot of the online culture is that it gets it is a, it's a kind of escapism you can just sort of tune into a youtube video for a while and it's that you know social media in general uh scroll through twitter for hours and all that sort of thing it's not um but again that's that you know that's related to what i was talking about before with it takes time and energy to, to be good at a, an art form or to study a, a particular literature or to you know to learn history so the problem is that we're all so adapted now to the the instant gratification and and the you know the the blinking screen that you get fewer and fewer people who want to set that aside and actually really you know put put forth the effort uh into some discipline which is i think yeah. that's related to the problem of the in real life versus online thing which is that uh you know people you can you can scroll through twitter on a on your way home or you know not if you're driving hopefully but on a bus or something you can't you know you can't learn to be a good painter or something in in, in an odd minute here or there it takes it takes time and and self-discipline so we're, we're sorely lacking that and i also think that's why we have so many of these um kind of silly uh you know the edgelord type that we, you were mentioning before like you know you know the the kind of playing footsie with nazis and all that it's like right. you get bored with just some online interactions. And if you don't have anything more substantive to go into for hours at a time, you just kind of keep pushing and pushing towards something yeah. more extreme. Yeah. Or at least that's how it seems to me. No, I, I think, I think, I think you're right. But then, but then again, you know, it's like, if we like, like, if there's going to be a movement that's, 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 that you want to be a part of that, that's exciting, yeah. actually moves the dial that moves the culture that does something, it's got to have that as a component, as, as difficult as it is. But I mean, and is it even difficult when well, you get excited about the thought well, of getting out there and meeting people and, and, and being real? You know what I mean? It's it depends nice. on who, you know what though, when I, when, so in grad school, the, the worst students were the woke students, right? I mean, I, so I think that there's a causal relationship there. Like we didn't use the word woke back then, but the, for example, the students who were kind of like your woman studies type or your, you know, your aggressively left wing where you want to turn every discussion of a, of, a, of fiction into some sort of political issue, they were always the worst students. So part of it is just an issue of quality, right? Quality interests me. I don't really care. I, I have some left wing writers that I love. Nelson Algren, for example, is one of my favorite novelists, and he was definitely a man on the left. So I, I'm interested in quality. And I think part of the problem is we're all getting in this habit of saying, is something woke or is it anti-woke? Oh, well, that's on my side then. But the real issue is, is something, is it a quality piece of writing or not? And it's so much easier to say, you know, why did, why did uh, whatever author write women this way? That's a really boring, easy thing to do. It's much harder to actually grapple with the writing itself and, and get, you know, do it to a close reading of the text and so on. So I think part of it is just a quality control thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I think it's disguised it as a political thing, but I think ultimately it's a quality issue. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Well, Panurge, which yeah. I say with my proud American pronunciation, <laughs> um, this has been great. Um, I'm I'm really glad we got to do this. I hope we can do this again. I still feel like there's yeah. a ton to talk about. Um, and uh, yeah, so maybe. Uh, we can set set this up for some time in the absolutely, future. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, hopefully, by then I'll have some more stuff uh, published that we can, you know, get into if you want. Um, and I everybody, pitch just my, to, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go I ahead. just wanted to 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 recap about uh, everyone should check out your writing. Um, it's at Ontario House Magazine. Just click the link that will be in the description. Of the sayings of Cinesius, uh, a manuscript. It's yeah. uh, really, I think, one of the most enjoyable things that um that i read in the last two years maybe so um i really appreciate that thank you um okay thanks for inviting me on all right see ya okay bye